This is another episode of Design Your Dream Home with Doug and Steve. And now the architects, Doug Pat and Stephen Chung. You are listening to the Design Your Dream Home podcast with Doug and Steve. We're both architects and we're here to help you design your dream home. Good morning, Doug. Stephen Chung, how are you, man? How are you? It's been a little hiatus with the holidays. Yeah, dude, I got to go on a diet. It's going to get even worse in like three <laughs> weeks. Luckily, this is a podcast that no longer um, <laughs> take me. <laughs> yeah, really good. All right, exactly. So I connected um, in the fall with an architect uh, out of Austin named Wynn Whitman, and I was checking out his work. It's pretty, uh, pretty impressive uh, projects, and I thought he would be a fantastic guest for us. So today we have Wynn Whitman from Wynn Whitman Architecture uh, out of Austin, Texas. Welcome, Wynn. Thank you, Stephen. Thanks, Doug. Great to be hey, here. Man. Good to see you, man. Hey, so when uh, let me just give you a little bio, a little background, um, just so people know who you are, where you've come from. Uh, as I said, you're from Win Win Architecture, based in Austin. Your work has been featured in many publications, including Architectural Record, Architectural Digest, the the Rob Report, Discovery Network, HGTV. So wow. you've been out and about in all different places. You have a BA from Tufts, which is out near me, which is interesting. I'll have to ask you about that because that's not probably an undergraduate degree in architecture. You have a master's degree in architecture from the University of Texas at Austin, a school I know fairly well because I taught there a long time ago. Received awards from the AIA World Architecture News and Best Green Innovation for uh, apparently some kind of panel design, which I saw in your house. It looks very interesting. So thank you very much, Wynn. Uh, again, I could go on and on about your background, all the awards, but uh, that would take up too much time. We want to learn more about you and uh, and uh, and your process and, and your firm. So let me ask you one quick question first. Tufts, what did you study there? Because I know that they do not have an architectural program. So what did you do before architecture? I studied art history, English literature, and human factors engineering. Oh, my <laughs> with a little bit of uh, Middle, East, Middle Eastern history thrown in there. Holy cow. Just kind of liberal arts. Good, yeah. good. You know, and so many people specialize uh, in their education, and I think that we're entering an age with artificial intelligence where just knowing many different disciplines and being able to think creatively about solutions is really going to be what's valued more than this highly focused knowledge about a certain area. Hmm, that's that's actually pretty interesting. So are you from hmm. this Boston area? I am from the Boston area, ah. but my, my art history professor, uh, uh, Margaret Henderson Floyd, she uh, pulled me aside one day and she said, when Boston is way too parochial for you, you ah. need to go to Austin, Texas. What? And... Thought, what the hell is in Austin, Texas? <laughs> this was back, you know, this was 30 years ago. It was This was back before Austin was a thing. And uh, I was considering UT Austin, and I was considering University of Pennsylvania. Great school. And uh, school. Yeah. That's where I went to school. And I went to Penn first, and Gosh. it was February. It was freezing cold. Dude. Everybody was bundled up. You come in, you see the big oil tanks. I mean, there there are more, there are more uh, oil tanks in Philadelphia than there are in Houston. <laughs> 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 so, uh, so I went there, and I'm like, okay. And then the following week, I went down to Austin. It was 72 degrees. Oh, dude! Everybody was walking around in flip flops. I had my first margarita and fajitas and saw all the beautiful girls. And I just said, you know, man, this is the place for me. And (laughs) 30 years later, uh, I've never once regretted it. But interestingly enough, I never really thought in terms of, okay, uh, what what is going to be the best city for me to settle in? If I want to fully express myself as as a cutting edge modern architect who serves his clients at the highest level, and uh, back then, you know, Austin was not that, that place. 
but um you know over the years it really has become that and there's something about the mindset of people here there's something about the natural terrain you know it's a beautiful hilly area where uh you know it's very green there's lots of water and so there's a lot of uh really challenging building sites that don't necessarily lend themselves to a traditional Cape Cod salt box, you know. So, um, so it it just worked out really fortuitously, is all I can say. Um, and uh, you know, I took a, a rather unconventional route to architecture. So when I graduated, uh, I, I had studied with uh, AIA gold medal winner Charles Moore, oh who God. was. Yeah, one of the pioneers of the postmodern movement. And I came from Boston where there's all this incredible history, of course, in the East Coast and the architecture, to this place that was sort of a blank slate. And, um, you know, the East Coast stuff, while I'll, I'll always have a place in my heart for traditional architecture, the postmodern stuff just didn't really resonate with me because it seemed like the image of the past without the substance. And I remember this vividly. Charles took us on a, a trip down to New Orleans, which was amazing to see for the first time because it's a city, it's really the only city in America where I feel like I'm in Europe, you know. And I drove his yellow Mustang convertible. Uh, he told me all these great stories about Frank Lloyd Wright, which I can get into later. But he was a student of Frank Lloyd Wright's. And we got down there and we went to see his Piazza d'Italia. And none of the fountains were working. There was garbage in the fountains. And, and you know, these, these plywood corinthian columns <laughs> that were kind of peeling and falling down and i just no one was there no one was hanging out there yeah. and then you go two streets over and you know you walk down royal street and it's packed and it's got this vibrant life and and i just i just said this isn't it okay this this is not what i want to do so i i didn't know a whole lot about modern architecture contemporary architecture except I was a big fan of Le Corbusier because like him, I, I did art, I did woodworking, I did music and all kinds of creative endeavors interested me. And so I graduated from, got my master's and it was the depths of a recession. Nobody was hiring architects. What year was this? This was 1991. And it was a time when uh, there was a savings and loan crisis going on. And they had set up a company called the Resolution Trust Corporation that was selling off assets of these failed savings and loans. And these were like, you know, you know, a guy loans his brother-in-law $2 million uh, on a signature loan with no recourse, that, that kind of thing stuff that they don't do anymore, fortunately. And I started buying up properties for like $20,000, $30,000, fixing them up, flipping them. And at a certain point, I was driving down one of the major thoroughfares here in Austin, B Caves Road. And I see this unfinished frame of an office building, 14,000 square foot office building with 14 acres. And they had hastily slapped some blue glass up on it so they could get their draw request and, you know, say it was done. And you know, there was nothing inside and all the plumbing was ripped out and there was no roof on it. But it was in an absolutely gorgeous setting on, you know, a prime road in Austin. So I put in an offer uh, for $105,700, my lucky numbers, five, seven. And I got it. Dude. And 
we spent the next year and a half building this office building and we did it without any skilled labor. I would go down to the uh, uh, homeless shelter in the morning and like pick guys up and bring them out there. No building permits. We rented heavy equipment and uh, we actually hit a major water line on Super Bowl Sunday and drained like over a million gallons from uh, <laughs> one of those mushroom <laughs> towers. Oh my God! <laughs> uh, I ended up getting a bill uh, like six months later for $64 for the water. <laughs> so Texas was just like the Wild West. And I was 27 years old. I finished, I'm, I'm about to finish the building. A man drives up and he gets out and uh, his name was Michael Reese. And it turned out that he had a company called Reese Design and they designed aircraft interiors for the Saudi princes, Adnan Khashoggi, the Sultan of Brunei, guys like that. And he wanted to buy my building. And he bought it, and uh, I was 27. I made about a million dollars. Oh, my God. And I did what every 27-year-old does. I flew up to Chicago and drove home in a red Ferrari. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, I like to say that I invested 90% of the money in women and cars, and I wasted the other 10%. <laughs> <laughs> Dude, but, that's a crazy story yeah yeah so that was my introduction to architecture and so i never I, I always took a very entrepreneurial approach to architecture and development so i began doing these crazy spec homes one of them is called soaring wings for example it's got these copper wings and it actually sold in 2007, right before the crash, at the highest price per square foot of any house ever sold in Austin. Um, oh my God. So, when let's back up for a second. So, you, yeah. you should explain this. Like, when you are acting entrepreneurial, you are an architect that's building on spec. Why don't you explain for our listeners what that means? So, that means that I'm, I'm financing it. Uh, usually with a bank, you know, putting a certain amount down, uh, locating the property, acquiring the property, designing it for a specific buyer. And a lot of spec builders play it very safe. Mm -hmm. But what I realized is you only need one person. You don't need to appeal necessarily to the masses with a spec. You just have to have something extremely compelling and, you know, that somebody is just going to want to, you know. So when you say you're designing for one person, you don't have that buyer yet, but you're designing with a person in mind. Is that correct? Right. A type of person in mind. And this is a really great time, Doug, to kind of talk about the type of person who I find typically comes to me to design a house. Okay. It's like a lot of times, so I teach courses in architecture. There's a group that I have called the Self-Built Architect. And it's about entrepreneurship and architecture. It's kind of a side uh, line. I offer AIACS uh, credits. And, and one thing I see students saying is, you know, they have to basically convince people that they need an architect. I've never had to do that. I may have had to convince them to hire me versus another architect, but the people who are coming to me and, you know, their budgets vary. I mean, they, I'm doing a thousand square foot house now, uh, 400 a foot, you know, the budget's around 400,000 and I'm doing a 15,000 square foot house where the budget's a thousand a foot. So, but what those people have in common is they want to live differently. They don't want to live in somebody else's house, some a house that isn't supportive of their 
vision of who they are and how they want to live. And this home is an expression of them. And I always find it rather puzzling when architects have a style, because if you look in my work, there's definitely a continuity there, but really my style is ultimately derived from the person I'm building for. And it would be foolish for me to try to pigeonhole them into some preconceived notion of how they should live. Now, have I learned things over the years as far as what works and what doesn't work? And, oh, gee, you probably don't want that big garden tub that takes up like, you know, 80 square feet um, that you're never going to use. You know, things like that. But I tend to derive my approach to each home from the vibe that I get from that particular client. And... Most of them are, are, are individualists, they're, they're generally self-made, they're, um, they're particular about how they live, they're into more experiences than things, mm -hmm. and ultimately I view a custom dream home as an experience more than a thing, if it's done right. So when you talk about the designing for a person, I mean, you have two kinds of um, projects, it seems, at least. One is that somebody comes to you and say, hey, design a house for me. The other is when you act on, you build on speculation. So there is no client. You're imagining you know, a client, I guess. So when, yeah. how do you do that? How do you, you find a site and you say, who, who might this person be? And let me design for that imaginary person. How do you do that? I think I take into account um, the preferences that clients have expressed over the years. And fortunately, I think it gives me a little bit of perspective because, uh, you know, when I listen to realtors, you know, and, and what they say that people want, but like I'm currently working with a spec builder and and he's just convinced that all of his homes should have these giant eight panel sliders that open up the whole living room. And everybody that I know that has done that, it, you know, it sounds like a great idea. In Texas, it's not a great idea. Our climate doesn't allow it. The one time I did that and, and we wanted to open it up for photographs, it was around dusk. We opened it up and about half a, half a million moths flew into the house. Yeah, it was a disaster. So a lot of the spec builders will keep their homes very neutral. One of my, one of my, everything's beige, you know. And I remember I specified this blue tile for a bathroom one time on the spec house that I designed for somebody else. And I, I very rarely do that. But the house didn't sell because it was very poorly built. And because the spec builder, the developer, had basically asked me to sacrifice the quality of the spaces for just you know, uh, um, getting the maximum number of square feet that could possibly be placed on that site <laughs> by law. And so that and cheaping out on finishes. And when it hadn't sold six months later, a realtor came through and said, well, maybe it's that blue tile. Oh my gosh, <laughs> I love it. <laughs> Remember coming through. And seeing that they had ripped out the blue tile and they had put in some kind of putty color, you know. <laughs> and I'm like, so I have that, a picture of the bathroom before the blue tile on my house, house.com account, which some of your listeners, if, you know, if you're getting excited about architecture, you want to see different styles, you know, that's one place to go, H-O-U-Z-Z. -Z, dot com and you can you know 
punch in French country or, you know, whatever, copper vent hood and, and a thousand images will come out. Yeah. Um, but uh, I have that picture on, on my house account and it's one of the top downloaded bathroom images like of all time. And uh, it That's looks horrible with the other with the other tile in it. So who knows? Who, who knows? When you're building a spec house, there's a great deal of just plain luck in it, timing of the market and that kind of thing. Um, I'm not doing any right now because we're kind of at the end of a, a long cycle of upward trending in our housing market and things seem to be slowing down. Uh, the good thing about that for anybody who's considering building is, you know, lumber prices have come down a little bit. The trades are going to get comp more competitive now than they have been over the last couple of years where we've seen, you know, huge escalation in labor uh, prices for building a home. And, uh, I don't think it's necessarily a bad thing. So when, um, this is all really interesting. Um, we, uh, you know, part of what we do in every program is to try to give some advice to homeowners. So this time let's use real people. Why don't yeah. we talk about some things that you might uh, advise for somebody who is embarking on this idea of designing a dream home? What, what, what would be some things you're sort of excited about these days, things that you yeah. think might help? Well, one, one is a thought just about overall approach that, uh, you know, listen to your architect and <laughs> builder as far as pricing goes. A lot of times people come in with unrealistic pricing uh, because somebody's brother-in-law did it yeah. 10 years ago for X and they suddenly latch on to a number and think of it, leave a little bit of room in your budget. Start by going to a mortgage broker, figure out how much you can really afford. And I, I tend to think of myself as a guide, as a trail guide, more than an architect. So much of what we do as architects is just guiding people and directing them and introducing them to the realtor and the mortgage broker. And people don't realize this. They think, oh, well, the architect just, just draws the plans. And anytime somebody comes to me and says, picks up the phone, hey, I need a set of plans, I <laughs> automatically know, <laughs> I'm sure you guys have had this, that is just like the biggest red flag that can possibly go <laughs> on in love your it. mind. Yeah, because you know that they don't value yeah. your contribution or they don't fully understand, like, Okay, so we serve a lot of the Indian community, the Pakistani community. And so we have a lot of clients uh, and who are very interested in Vastu, which is the Indian feng shui. Okay, wow. it's the organization of spaces and beds have to face north and you don't want to enter a bedroom from the south and... Uh, mm -hmm cooking should be on the east side and um and we actually have a full-time uh employee in india who's an expert in this oh my gosh and you know it, you come to an architect and you don't you don't think of these little things and you don't think you know like the first 10 times or 20 times i did this Maybe I specified the wrong wood siding. And then finally, on the 21st time, I found this, you know, U.S. Lumber Brokers Prime Line Cedar, and boom, you know, it's, it's not as expensive as clear. It's not, you know, give them a little plug. Um, or, you know, a certain type of window. Uh, just... And we can get next, we can get into stylistic uh, things uh, like you had asked earlier. But I think, think of it like going into a car dealership. 
you see the base price of the car and you think that that's the price you're going to pay when in reality there are all these options you want the leather and you want the lumbar support and the the blackout trim package and before you know it it's 15 or 20 percent more than you went in there intending to pay and and you know what? If it's the car you want, it's worth it. And I look at it the same uh, with my homes. I'm I'm building my own home right now. And if I spend an extra hundred or two hundred thousand, and I really look at, uh, and it makes the difference between having like a house that's just okay or a house that's like. Wow, you know, in terms of the quality and the, it doesn't have to be expensive materials, but really, here's another misconception that homeowners uh, think. So they they get two bids from a prospective builder, and those bids are 30, 40% apart. I mean, there's like a huge range. And they think, oh, well, the builder with the higher estimate is making more money. In reality, I've found that every builder is making about the same amount of money. It's totally like true. 17, 18, 20%, whatever it's worth their while. All the rest of that goes into the quality of the subs and the supervision and the exactitude of building your home. It's, and, and, and every homeowner has that choice. And I just know... If I'm walking up and down that hallway every day and the drywall is bowed and there's like this, I'm just, it's going to bug the shit out of me. And so, <laughs> and if the roof is leaking and I have a friend who's a painter and he posted these images on Facebook the other day and he showed his studio that he was building, spending a couple hundred grand on and, and it showed these site built steel windows that looked really cool but that are going to sweat in the cold uh -huh. and there was no pan no waterproofing under them whatsoever and there was no like a little bit of tie that, yeah. no thermal break and i've done these windows with no thermal break but they will con condensation will form on the inside it'll drip down yeah. and you have to have a pan under them to collect that and somehow get it out so he didn't have that, and I mentioned this to him, and I said, and it was a well-known architect, and I said, Did, does so-and-so know about this? And he said, no, because the last time I brought it up, he, I, he got in an argument with the builder, and the architect was trying to help him, even though he did kind of an abbreviated set of drawings for this particular artist. Um, very well-known architect would never have designed it that way would never have approved of it and uh and the owner was literally afraid to have the architect advocate for them and that one thing i want people to know you know my clients to know is that if i see something that's not right here's how i'm going to handle that i don't go running to the client and the reason i don't go running to the client is i want to maintain a good relationship with the builder I go to the builder, I say, here, you know, I'm thinking that this needs a little more waterproofing on it or whatever. If the builder tells me to go fly a kite, then I have to bring it up with the client. Right. Uh, however, for long term, you know, ease and, and relationship of working with the builder, I'd rather not make him look bad mm -hmm. because he's going to have an opportunity to make me look bad. Right. Absolutely. <laughs> if I make him look bad, he's going to make me look bad. At which point the client is going to feel like this thing is going off the rails. They're going to get anxious. They're going to, you know, and I'm sure you guys get part of our job is we get these calls like right after dinner. Usually is. <laughs> so like, you know, and the phone rings and it's like, the client is just freaking out because, <laughs> because something uh, uh, that they didn't realize yeah. about their house. And that's another reason we use 
3D rendering from a very early stage. We use SketchUp a lot just to, because it's really quick and, and we can change out materials, we can move things. I've got a guy who works for me, he's so fast that he can literally do it. We're in an on-screen meeting. I'm in Dallas, the client's in uh, Springfield, Missouri, and my cat operator's in Austin, and we're all on the meeting just like this. And we're moving the model around and we change the the floor from wood to white tile and we raise the roof up three feet. And, you know, I just got done with one of those meetings. Oh, and great. so to the extent that we can take the uncertainty out of it for the client and and make it as smooth as possible. Now, having said that, it's still there's always going to be a point in every project and it usually happens so when a when a house starts being built it goes very quickly initially as you know mm -hmm. you know the framing the slab goes in the framing flies up you know, whoa okay yeah and then it looks like nothing is happening for about six to eight months right yeah. and, and that's when all the the plumbing and electrical and the guts and the yeah, yeah is, is going in. And clients tend to freak out uh, at a certain point. And they don't know what's going on. The, the You know, the spaces, because you've got all this sheathing up that's dark, right? Mm -hmm. The space feels small. Yeah. They feel dark. <laughs> yeah. And let me tell you, when that drywall goes on, it's like, boom, oh, man, okay, now I see. Now I see what's going on. This place feels huge. And here's another thing that people should take to heart and a trend that I'm seeing in homes. People are spending less time in their bedroom. The bed, the bed chamber, you know, back in the day, 20, 20 years ago, uh, you know, you were seeing these – 20 foot by 23 foot bedrooms and or bed chambers and now you know we might do a, a 14 by 15 foot uh bedroom for a master smaller for secondary like 13 12 you know by 13 something like that and that and that space is going into areas off of the master to so the master suite now the bathroom is getting bigger the maybe there's a little home office off the master where if somebody's not sleeping well in the middle of the night they can they can just go in there and get a little work done on their laptop but the outdoor living spaces are getting bigger and nicer and and more covered and uh bells and whistles and outdoor kitchens and things the indoor spaces are tightening up hmm. and uh and the bedrooms are getting smaller windows black the most important thing is being able to black out like my house right now i had this corner glass oh my god a beautiful view of the canyon but you can't really black that out very effectively and you know and so i took away one wall of windows i just you know, I, I just want to be able to sleep. It's got to be quiet and it's got to be dark. So there, those are some trends. Um, there's kind of a cool trend, trend right now in kitchens where uh, instead of like a countertop and then upper cabinets above it, you're having more like cabinet doors, uh, continuous maybe seven or eight feet high that flip out and then slide back in and maybe there's a counter behind there all all sorts of pantry items and and storage and and built-ins behind that uh there's also in kitchens the butler's pantry has become a big deal uh and that's a little walk-in pantry with a countertop where you can put your coffee maker and your appliances and all the unsightly, your keys. And, mm. you know, you can keep, since we've gone to more open kitchen designs that are open to living areas, the yeah. kitchen has had to step it up and look less, uh, less like a kitchen. Yeah. Less, right, less cluttered. Yeah. Less cluttered. 
And I think it's a great trend. We're also getting away from, believe it or not, seats at the island. The oh. island is becoming a more of a sculptural element, uh, oh. maybe with a, a, a another like cantilevered uh, little tabletop that comes off one end of it, but huge. You know, there might be a little a few stools here and there. Uh, Have you found that that uh, people are asking more about green features being incorporated in the home? They are asking about them, and we just did a zero net zero energy oh, wow. home. Oh, did you? Uh, yeah, out on a sixty acre ranch uh, in Marble Falls, Texas. It's called Casa Tre Cortile. It's on our website, winwhitman.com. Two T's, no H. W-I-N-N, W-I-T-T-M-A-N. And that was very important to these people. Uh, and we've done quite a few ranch homes, uh, rainwater collection. In this case, we wanted to have a flat roof uh, so as not to, you know, the house was very incognito. They didn't want to be able to see it from anywhere, from any of the roads, public roads nearby or anything like that. And uh, we had to find a material that was suitable for potable water. And we ended up hiring a, a chemist as a consultant to basically analyze the composition of various uh, flat roofing products. For oh example, gosh. fiber tight, which is a great flat roof, will absolutely kill you. If you drink <laughs> <laughs> but... There is a material, it has cyanide or something like that in it. But there's another material called EverGuard TPO. They make it in nice, thick, 50, 80 mil. And EverGuard TPO, our chemist told us, would be suitable. And we actually went back in, took samples a year later, and, and it worked like a charm. Absolutely delicious, clean, potable water. So cool. But to, to come back to your question, Stephen, people ask about it. They don't always do it. And the reasons are twofold. Our homes right now uh, with spray foam insulation and thermally broken windows and, you know, all of the technology uh, for passive uh, solar gain have gotten so efficient and I, I'm shocked. I mean, I'm just shocked at how, how efficient they are and how little they cost uh, if they're, and you don't have to have small windows either, by the way. Uh, you just have to have decent overhangs in some cases. And a lot of times we separate out our cladding from the uh, sheathing so that there's an air space that uh, air can convect up through and, uh, you know, you just have to look at what is really green. So a few years ago, you remember they had the compact fluorescent bulbs. And these were supposedly the green answer to everything. Uh -huh. but, but they have mercury in them. And they, and they give off terrible light quality. Right. And they make people sick, basically. And uh, same thing, by the way, with LED lights have some issues as well. Um, really? Yeah. Uh, there's a lot of blue light in LED. There's no infrared. So infrared is healthy. Infrared is what it's like a sun lamp and a halogen bulb. That's what gives it that warm glow with your LED lights to get that that warm color they're essentially just coloring them right but they're not really creating the infrared light which is great because it takes a great deal of energy and it creates a great deal of heat right. to create that but one thing that i like to do is use like in very intimate romantic areas be it a dining room or maybe a master bath or bedroom I still like to use the halogen 
bulbs. Right. Because they have that beautiful warm glow that, that you see when you go to a, a beautiful dimly lit restaurant. Sure. Or something like that. When, let's go back to uh, something you said uh, early in our conversation. So you're an entrepreneur, kind of an entrepreneur at heart, clearly, and that's your personality type, obviously. Um, what I found really interesting is you didn't get caught up in postmodernism, which it was very easy for all of us. I think you and I graduated school around the same time. And I know everybody was just ready to get out and do this kind of work. Um, then you tell us about the story where you buy an office building, and, which is unbelievable. I mean, you're, you're, you're buying up homes and you're flipping them. You're a young guy. I'm, I'm fairly certain you'd have a ton of money and you're slowly making a little bit of money. You buy this office building, you put in an offer, you get it. Then you sell it, you make a million bucks. Uh, I'm thinking about our listeners. I mean, these are incredible stories. Uh, and clearly it has a lot to do with who you are, but how do you, people are going to do something, uh, that's extraordinarily rare when they, uh, design a custom home or even put on an addition or renovate their house. You're right. It's only really, 3%, only 3% it, of homes in America. There you go. 3%. So that's a really scary thing to do. What is it about you or what would you recommend that people do to kind of get in this mindset that, hey, I want to take a risk and I want to do this. You, you were saying earlier as well, you know, you make these decisions and many times they're the best decisions. Spend a little bit more money and make it the way you want it. So <clears throat> what do you think? I think uh, it's better to build something smaller in a great neighborhood. Okay. I think where people get into risk is building something, building the most expensive home in the neighborhood. Interesting. Right. The castle. Yeah. And going out, uh, a, a client took me out to a property maybe a year ago and, you know, it was right by the highway and there were big power lines going overhead and it was facing due west and I and he's like, yeah, but it's 20 acres and it's so cheap. And, <laughs> and if he bought this, he'd have his 20 acres and he could spend his whatever, eight, 900,000 he wanted to spend on the home. And instead of spending, you know, 400,000 for the property, he was getting it for 180. But your property is not the place to save the money. Look at the school districts. OK, look, look at the homes in the neighborhood. If the homes justify it, then by all means, then it's not really a risk. Right. Or if you're going to live there for the next 20 years, you can always do what Frank Lloyd Wright did. And he was also a developer and a spec builder. And he said, you go 10 miles out of town and you figure out which way the town is headed and you buy land out there. Yeah. Now, now there isn't that much more of that explosive kind of growth uh, that we saw in the latter half of the last century and maybe even the early part of this century. But you're right, it's a risk. And uh, I also don't think it's smart to, you know, to do one of these uh, adjustable rate mortgages is for a very long period of time where uh yeah. you know you're you're basically at the mercy of whatever the rates are when it seems like a great deal to get you in yeah. to a house um so if you just kind of uh look if you if you also invest in good architecture and a good quality builder in a good neighborhood, that's about the best you can do to minimize your risk. Yeah. There's always going to be some inherent risk in, in whatever you do. Uh, but, uh, you know, it's no risk, no reward. Right. 
So sadly, we have to end this now. Um, I know that you have to you have to yeah. take off when. Um, where can people find you? I mean, there's you have some amazing um, advice. I, I asked for three, you gave about thirty three. So, right <laughs> so thank you for that. Uh, where can people find you? Learn more My about pleasure. You? Yeah. My pleasure. Yep, yeah, they can. Uh, they can call my office and uh, set up an appointment, winwitman.com, W-I-N-N-W-I-T-T-M-A-N.com. We, uh, we build all over the country, design all over the country, uh, 512-630-2724. You can go to our website and you can set up, you can fill out what's called my vision blueprint which will guide you through uh, figuring out exactly the type of home that you like. And then I'll be in a more informed position when we talk. And uh, don't be afraid to reach out. I don't charge for the initial consultation. And uh, even if you're not a good fit for me and we don't currently really take on any jobs with a construction budget of under a million, but even if you're not a good fit for me, I'm happy to point you in the right direction towards someone who could help you. I should also know on your website, what's really interesting was the process, the explanation of the process. I don't see a lot of architects doing that, so I really appreciate that. That's meaning, that's really for a client to sort of understand, okay, this is step one, this is what will happen, this is step two, this is step three. So um, I would definitely advise anyone uh, interested to look at that on your website. That's a really great document, so I, I really appreciate that. Thanks. Yeah, we have some other resources, and also we have a we have a page on Facebook where periodically I'll I'll you know do Facebook lives and I'll show uh, something unique about a particular home that we're building or uh, some bit of information that might be helpful. I know that it's uh, it's a long process usually that somebody goes through in trying to envision and then uh, bring life to their dream home. But what I have also learned is, like I'm fond of saying, you know, first it seems impossible and then it becomes inevitable. Oh, that's great. That's, that's great. fantastic way to leave it. Thank you so yeah. much, man. It's been fantastic yeah. to talk to you. Thanks Thank very you, much, Stephen. Wynn Whitman. Thanks, uh, thanks for your time. It's been, it's been really informative. Super to have you here. So you've been listening to the Design Your Dream Home podcast with Doug and Steve. Remember to shoot us an email with questions. We love to hear from you. Thanks for joining us, and we look forward to next time.